I see a future where underrepresented communities are no longer underrepresented, that we are part of the makeup of the outdoor industry, period. And that this DEI work falls by the wayside because it's happening and there's no longer the need to bring attention to it. Welcome to The Future We Want, a podcast for rebellious leaders ready to get to work, do the work, and create the future we want. I'm Rafael Bemberat, founding partner of BBMG, a branding and social impact agency that works with leaders that won't wait on things that can't wait. Very few things nowadays, sadly, really bring out this sense of feeling alive and, and allow us to break routines or challenge assumptions. And I think the outdoors can offer all of that. We can't really deal uh, with the environmental crisis without also dealing with the problems of, of poverty and equity. On today's episode, we're heading outside and asking some big questions about the outdoor industry, what it means for everybody to feel welcome, safe, and inspired outside, and the role of brands in shaping our relationship with nature. I am thrilled to welcome an amazing co-host for this conversation, my dear friend, BBMG colleague, and daily inspiration, Amanda Yogendran. Hey, Amanda, thanks for co-hosting today and for bringing your amazing voice your perspective, and your humanity to the future we want. Hi, Rafe. I'm so happy to be here and excited to chat. Well, we're thrilled to have you and to dive deeper with three incredible guests today. So first, we have Teresa Baker. She's the founder of the In Solidarity Project and the Outdoor CEO Diversity Pledge. And um, she'll help us understand the context for why it's essential to diversify the outdoors, how we got where we are today, and what matters most now. Then we'll turn to our colleague and friend, Sarah Crockett, who is the CMO of Backcountry. And after leading marketing for many iconic brands like Burton, REI, and Vans, Sarah's going to help us think about the perspective of how brands are leading to make the outdoors more inclusive. And we will conclude with Vincent Stanley, the longtime leader and current director of philosophy at Patagonia. And Vincent's going to help us understand the moment we're in, what's at stake, and where we go from here to create a truly radically better future outside that includes all of us. Before we dive into the content, Amanda, I am curious, how would you describe your relationship with the outdoors? Like, what's it all about for you? And what experiences of the outdoors come to mind for you? It's a great question. Um, you know, if I were to think about, if I were to reflect on the things that have shaped me as an adult, I think it's two things. It's listening to a lot of Lauren Hill when I was a kid and being in the mountains um, and being outside of them. So I grew up in British Columbia, BC, where we have, you know, a lot of access to mountains, to water. Um, and that was just part of my life growing up. And I think the outdoors was a place for me as a kid where, you know, I learned the value of trying something new, being really bad at it, and then trying again, and then finding joy in that progress of getting better. So that confidence in knowing just because you're not good at something today doesn't mean you can't master it in the future. Um, and that's a mindset I think that I've taken with me outside of the outdoors in my life. And it the seeds of my ambition and resilience, I think, were sown in the mountains playing as a kid. Was that skiing, snowboarding, hiking? What was like, what was the way you experienced the mountains in BC? So snowboarding, a bit of skiing, hiking a lot. But yeah, I like to think of myself as an amateur everything. You know, mountain biking is a new activity that I've taken up. Awesome. I was born in New York, but I grew up in basically the, the suburbs of Dallas. And so the way that I experienced nature was really twofold. One, my grandparents on my mom's side lived in New York um, after we moved to Texas. And I would come visit them and they had this beautiful house on Lake Copake in upstate New York. I would go every summer as a kid, often bring friends and 
spend probably somewhere between three and six weeks with my grandparents. And I would remember like they had a house that had a dock onto this beautiful lake and they had a rowboat. And I remember we would get up early, especially for teens. Like we'd get up at five in the morning and we would row out into the lake. And it was at a moment where it was completely still and this bright pink sky was mirrored like glass on the water. And you'd see just a couple ripples from fish that were jumping. And my friend Billy and I, we would fish, we would just sort of kind of sit there. And it was like a moment where you're like, wow, as kids from the suburbs in Dallas, it was a kind of communion with nature that changed our cell structure, like literally changed how we experienced life. And then I've really appreciated the ocean, the feel of the waves against your body, the rhythms um, of the ocean and the waves on a daily basis, the, the kind of way that it resets your rhythms has been really powerful. And I'm like you, very much an am amateur at everything, went from a, you know downhill skiing and hiking and biking. But those kind of seminal experiences in my youth, I think, shaped who I am in the world. And it really raises, you know, for me, at a moment where we're thinking about not just the existential threat of climate and preserving wild spaces and thinking about the role of nature and humanity, but um, what we think about in terms of people's participation in nature, access to nature, and diversifying the way that all of us can feel at home and safe and in our, in our best selves outside. And I think that's what this conversation today is all about. Yeah. What I love about that story, Rafe, is that, you know, I picture that lake and the serenity of that lake and the peace of that lake. And then also I have my experience of like trying stuff for the first time and that adrenaline rush and that challenge. And I think for the fact that nature can both be transcended in a peaceful way and transcended in a, and push you to the end of yourself way and that breadth of experience is the beauty of nature and we want that for everyone. So first up is my conversation with Teresa Baker sharing her journey as a human who loves the outdoors um, and how that led her to her groundbreaking work to diversify the industry. Teresa Baker, born and raised here in California, Ohlone land, grew up being hard-headed, you know, not listening to people tell me how I should be, how I should act. Spent a lot of time outdoors. It, it was just natural for us to be outdoors, unlike today, where kids are indoors doing everything electronic. But for us, it was get outdoors, don't come back until the streetlights come on. And that began my love of the outdoors of nature. We hiked, climbed, um, skied, played sports. It was just a natural way of being. And it wasn't until a trip to Yosemite, I believe, in 2016. For whatever reason, I took notice of the people who were around me. And not one person looked like me. And I spent an entire week in Yosemite during this trip and not one person looked like me. And I thought, hmm, that's odd. So when I got home, I reached out to the National Park Service and I said, hey, this was my experience. I think you guys have a diversity problem. And they said, yeah, we know. Help us fix it. And that began this journey of diversity and inclusion in the outdoors. What do you think is the biggest myth that people have about the outdoors? I would say people assume that communities of color, people of color are not in these outdoor spaces. When you look at the history of this country, we've always been Native Americans, Latino communities, African American communities. Nature has always been our foundation. We've used the land to navigate and to raise families. So we've always been there. So it's not a matter of connecting to the outdoors. It's a matter of reconnecting because, you know, rumors floating around have 
charged us with not caring. Um, so it's a matter of reconnecting and getting back to who we've always been. I really appreciate that reframe because it's not a new relationship. It's no. something we've always had. Absolutely. I mean, what do you think has caused that disconnection? When you look at the history, Native Americans have been removed. You look at our national parks, that land belonged to Native Americans. So they were forcibly removed. And it's like when you have, and I don't want to, you know, attack the National Park Service because they've made a lot of progress over the years. But when you have Shenandoah, who publicly had signs out saying, you know, blacks only or whites only, signs that said that, that sends a message that we're not welcome in certain spaces. So, you know, it, it has a lot to do with how the outdoors has been governed over the years. And then you have historically for the African-American communities, the outdoors have been places where lynchings were held. So we have these vivid images and it's passed down from our grandparents that these places aren't safe. So we hear that message and we're like, oh, that's not for us. So uh, it's, it's taken some time to remove those rumors and that's why it's important that NGOs and government agencies alike start to really show the inclusivity that people of color have had over the years. That's why it's amazing that Deb Halen is now in the position she's in with the DOI. So changes are happening, but it, you know, for some people, they're just embedded. These, these rumors are embedded. These images, the realities are embedded. So, you know, we are working to remove some of that fear, but it takes time. So the first time you and I connected was a year ago. It was last June, and it was in a moment of a lot of protests, a lot of conversations around um, racial justice. It was shortly after George Floyd. And for the outdoor industry, there was a moment of reckoning that we were in the middle of. There was a lot of conversations, a lot of activists in the space pushing for more diversity in the outdoors. Yeah. And yeah, we talked in the middle of that and it felt like a really exciting time and it felt like a turning point. It's a year later. What do you feel like has changed? <sighs> you know... This country has grown accustomed to reacting to situations as they arise. So it's like something happens. We put out a black square. We, we say black lives matter. For those of us who have been doing this work for years, we understand that the majority of that is just for show. And the reason I know is because when a company posts Black Lives Matter, I go and look at the makeup of their board and the makeup of their leadership. And if I don't see Black people, it was just for show. And a lot of people just follow the lead of others. And that's what we have to move away from. The fact that it took a pandemic and the murder of yet another Black man in this country to bring people to the table who had never been at the table, it's disheartening because that sends the wrong message. You should care about these issues even when we're not in the midst of trouble. And has there been change? Absolutely. There has been change. I see it every day. There are people doing this work who have never done this work before. And it's encouraging, but there's so much more to do. It has to move beyond a moment. It has to stay at the top of our list of what we need to take care of. Because what's at stake is these outdoor spaces that we love going unprotected. 
You know, it's like the racial demographic shift that's taking place in this country will affect the bottom line of every business if you are not intentionally engaging communities of color, people from underrepresented communities, because they will be the stakeholders. They are coming into being your customer base, the stakeholders in an industry beyond the outdoors. Tech is another industry that needs to step up and face these issues. But the racial demographic shift is going to force people to work with us. But in the midst of that, we're creating our own. Every morning I wake up, there's a new affinity group of color. So it's like we understand that you're pushing us aside and not being inclusive of us. So we're creating our own thing. And it's only a matter of time before we start creating our own outdoor gear. So, you know, for any leader in the outdoor industry who's paying attention, they know that they need to do something. And that's what's happening now. They're trying to find ways to work with these communities. And for some people, it's scary. They don't want to talk about race because that's the foundation of this. It's race. And this country has a difficult time dealing with that issue, the issue of race. But change is happening. I guess I'm curious, like, from your perspective, what does leadership look like right now? Leadership looks like people who are scared as hell and doing the work anyway, understanding that they must put their fear aside and work towards an inclusive outdoor community. They must. You know, leadership understands that their employees are demanding this. And the employees are asking because the public is demanding it. So they are responding. But, you know, people have this fear of this call out culture that's here. And that's that's paralyzing a lot of people. It's like we don't want to say the wrong thing. We don't want to do the wrong thing. But what I try to get people to understand is I want to give you space to try, fail and try again. That's the only way we're going to make progress in this work. I don't have all the answers. No one does. We're trying to. But I think leadership is finally understanding that just because they don't have all the answers doesn't give them an excuse to do nothing. So leadership is responding. Some a lot slower than others, but they're responding and they're reaching out for help. So that's all we can really ask is that they try. Yeah. And it's not absence of fear. It's actually working through the fear. that Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you've also talked a little bit about in our previous conversations about how important it is to keep and nurture those often those relationships with these communities, these affinity groups with um, disability groups with LGBTQ communities with every kind of intersection of inclusivity. Right. Like when you have those authentic relationships, it's not about being called out. It's about it's about when you make a mis- mistake, it's being called in to right. really reckon with that mistake. Right. And fix it. Right. Um, but that really takes work and time and trust. It does. But, you know, When you're in a multi-billion dollar industry, your bottom line is profit. And however you get to that profit is what you praise. And what's happening is several years ago, after I started working with the National Park Service, I thought to myself, okay, I'm starting to see progress with the Park Service Who's next? What what industry do I need to look at? And I started looking at the outdoor brands and retailers, specifically their social media feeds. And I'm like, damn, I don't 
don't see people that look like me. Again, that's been my theme, not seeing people that look like me. So I started looking at major brands, their social media feeds, and, and, and seeing the typical white male, white female across the board doing amazing feats in the outdoors, like climbing El Cap in 30 freaking minutes. You know, stuff that's amazing, and I don't want to take any of that away because that's an amazing um, feat to accomplish. But I wasn't seeing myself represented. I wasn't seeing kids who look like me represented. And that's a dangerous message to send because, again, it says we don't see you in our company as a climber a hiker, a skier, a cyclist. We don't see you. So again, kids look at that and they're like, oh, well, that's not for me. So the public messages we send stick with us and they create an image of who we are. And that's the importance of showing people from underrepresented communities doing these outdoor activities over social media. So That was part of the reason I wanted to start working directly with brands and retailers was to get them to better understand that you are missing one. You are missing out on a customer base that spends money like crazy. So that's money that's off the table for you because you're not including us. You know, in the, in the African-American community specifically, you see North Face like crazy. You see Nike, you see Adidas like crazy because they show us. Yeah. And you talk about inclusion with such depth too. I think it's, yes, it's representation in your marketing and your campaigns, but it's also a representation in changing the culture of the outdoors and including different experiences and different perspectives. It's not just about slapping a person of color on your marketing campaigns. It's about expanding kind of how we think about the outdoors and who fits. Right. It it is. Um, You know, a lot of times we define adventure, hiking the PCT for six months, You know, we we describe nature as these faraway places, but nature is right outside our front door. We need to re-examine how we describe adventure and nature because that too eliminates a lot of people from participating because they feel if I can't hike for six hours, you know, and and cover a hundred miles, then I'm not an adventurer. You know, that that's that again is not for me. So we need to redefine what adventure and nature is and and get people to understand that it's your local park, your regional park, in addition to our state and national parks. We need to redefine what the outdoors is. Yeah, I love that. Especially, you know, I live in Brooklyn. Getting to nature is not easy. I go to the park for nature and then you have to get in the car and it's not always accessible. So right. finding nature where you are is a, yeah, is a bigger and better invitation. Right. Because then it's more inclusive. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit more about In Solidarity Project, which is something you started. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what it is, why you started it, I know that you've been working with brands for a while, but In Solidarity Project is relatively new. So tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. um, Gosh, three years ago, I reached out to a guy named Chris Perkins, who just graduated Yale Environmental Programs. He freaking received two degrees from Yale in three freaking years. So I'm, I'm like, Super proud of him and his commitment and in the midst of all that, helping me on the pledge and got married. So I'm like, dang, Chris. But yeah, I reached out to Chris and said, Chris, I have this idea for a diversity pledge. And we talked about it and Chris was like, I'm in. Let's do it. So we created created the 
Outdoor CEO Diversity Pledge, uh, like I said, about three years ago. And the purpose behind that was to get CEOs of brands um, to make a commitment around diversity and inclusion within their company. Everything from leadership, boards, marketing campaigns, and also their athletes, their ambassadors. So the first year of that was really slow. It was a lot of reaching out to people, going to the outdoor retailer show in Denver, again, talking to people, making sure people were aware of the pledge. First year was slow. Second year, things started to pick up to where we didn't even, we stopped reaching out to people. People would reach out to us. And then last year with the pledge, we initially housed the pledge. Um, with Danielle Williams, Diversify Outdoors website. That's where the pledge was housed. And then last year, we made a decision that we need to move the pledge to its own resting place. And that became the In Solidarity Project. So the pledge is listed there where people can go and see all the brands. I think we're at 180 now who have signed the pledge Um, We also have a job board there now. Um, We have an event pay uh, tab there. It's it's a place to house the work that we're doing. In addition to the pledge, everything else that we're doing, our steering committee members are listed there. It's been amazing how well received it has been. But yeah, it's a place to house our work, to share publicly what we're doing, and to share how we are holding these brands who signed the pledge accountable. And we don't say yes to everyone. We don't want people to say, we care about diversity. Look, we signed a pledge. That's not how it works. We hold these brands accountable. We've removed about 20 companies since January of this year because we require that they submit a yearly report. And if they don't submit that report, we, we remove them. There's no conversation needed. You're removed. You don't get to sit there and point to the pledge as the work because signing the pledge isn't the work. The work is everything that you do as a commitment to signing the pledge. Any other activists, organizations, or even brands that you feel like are embodying the change, the future that you want to see? Yeah. There are so many amazing people out there. Jose Gonzalez, uh, Patty Gonia with their crazy self. You have people like She Explores who talks about this work and women who are in the outdoors. Um, Unlikely hikers. Brands like Merrill are kicking butt. They use a a designer, uh, illustrator by the name of Jitterbug, Latasha Hudson who's amazing. She just came out with a shoe um, that she created with Mero. So it's that type of action that we need to see. We don't want you to just come to us, ask for advice and move on. We want you to create relationships with us. And Mero is doing that with their ambassadors. So I, I appreciate that. Granite Gear is another company that's doing good. Outdoor research is stepping up, doing amazing work. You have people like Stacy Bear, who's ex-military, who is intimidating as hell, just in his appearance. I think he's like 10 feet tall by, right now. He's doing amazing work. But there are a lot of people stepping up, doing this work, and I appreciate it. If I were to ask you to paint a picture of the future you want for nature and for the outdoors, what would that look like? It would be one and the same. People gathering for the protection of the outdoors, because that's what it's about. Climate change is real. And we need more warriors on the front line fighting for the protection of our watersheds, our forests, all of that. You look at Freaking Portland, Oregon, 103 degrees. That's ridiculous. That's climate change. It's here and it's affecting us. And if we want these outdoor spaces to remain for us to get out and cycle and ski and hike, we better accept the responsibility of protecting these spaces. So it's it's not one or the other. It's both. You know, it's 
we care about these outdoor spaces and we are going to fight to protect them or we will no longer have the means to get outdoors and recreate in the way we, we desire. Period. Period. Dropping, dropping the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I see a future where underrepresented communities are no longer underrepresented, that we are part of the makeup of the outdoor industry, period. And that this DEI work falls by the wayside because it's happening and there's no longer the need to bring attention to it. Yeah. It's no longer siloed as a, as a separate initiative. Right. It's yeah. Right. It's part it's, of the way we live ingrained. in. Ways. It's ingrained in all we do. Yeah. Okay. I have some rapid fire questions. Uh-oh. Just, to, just they're, they're more fun than anything else. Okay. Any, Activity or sport outside that you want to learn but haven't really gotten to yet? Mm, I would say maybe snowboarding. Um, I worked on a project recently with Burton Snowboards and Chill, the Chill Foundation. And I went to them and I said, hey, I have an idea, but I need you to help make it happen. And it was an idea to do a snowboard of artwork from kids. And they said yes to that. So the snowboard came out a few months ago and I'm like, Oh, now I have to get out there on it. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Once, you know, snow comes back here to at least somewhere in the, in the area of California. I would love to go snowboarding with you. Also (laughs) Burton is a BBMG client and partner. So Cool. That is very exciting. Cool. Oh, yeah. Check out their In Solidarity snowboard that they created. It's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. What are you most excited to see more of in this industry? Fun. We need to have more fun. You know, this work, again, is so difficult. It's taxing. It, 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 mentally, you just check out after a while. I'm hearing a lot of people say that. Um, but I want to have more fun. I want this work to be about fun and incorporated in that is our responsibility to the land. I want us to find ways to have fun together in the outdoors to show that while this work is difficult, the payoff is that we can get outdoors together and laugh and joke and have fun. So that that's my ultimate goal is that I can get these CEOs of these multi-million dollar companies outdoors and enjoying the labor of the hard work that's put in behind this DEI work. I can get on with with that. I'm, (laughs) I'm on board for more fun. Absolutely. Amanda, that was glorious. And I'm curious as a lifetime lover of the outdoors and a badass snowboarder yourself, what was most inspiring to you about Teresa's story and her work? And what's your takeaway for brands? I think what I loved about my conversation with Teresa was she spoke with such urgency because we don't have time to move on climate change. This is a now moment. And she also spoke with a lot of hope, which I think urgency and hope are two things that we don't hear together. I think she's seeing this work happen um, and she has a lot of optimism and, and hope in what we can create for the future for the industry, but also as we tackle climate change. And I think the takeaway for brands is get started now and do not worry about perfection, that steps forward and progress are what we want to focus on. So, and I loved how she talked about leadership, about how leadership is moving forward despite your fear and with your fear. Right on. And I think that is the perfect foundation to set up our conversation with Sarah Crockett, the visionary chief marketing officer at Backcountry. And as you'll hear, she's dedicated her life to making the awe and wonder of the outdoors more meaningful and accessible to everyone. And as one of Teresa's partners for the In Solidarity Project and as a brand signatory of the CEO Diversity Pledge, Sarah and her team at Backcountry are reimagining the idea of representation in the outdoor industry and breaking trails with a new platform for a radically better future out there for all. Hi, Sarah. Hey, how's it going? Good. It is so awesome to see you. 
It's great to see you too. Thank you for making time for the Future We Want podcast and for joining us. I have to say it has been an absolute thrill to work together with you and your awesome herd at Backcountry to help further the pursuit of that heart-stopping, horizon-expanding sense of awe and wonder um, that can happen when we're out there. And also, you know, to work together to help champion the belief that we all belong in the backcountry. I've been inspired by you for many years. I'm thinking back to the role that you've played at REI. And I think culturally, some of the most iconic moments, whether that's opt outside or force of nature, you know, the the way that the brand started to speak in a new way uh, that kind of bridged from not only outdoor experiences, but to ask the big questions about life and who we want to be and how we want to live and what that means for a role of, of the out there and, and outside in our lives. Similarly, at Burton, making the mountain and the wild energy of the mountain available to everyone, the work that you've done to help diversify the mountain, to bring more women and people of different backgrounds into snowboarding and into mountain culture, life, and lifestyle. And now at Backcountry, what I love about Backcountry is it's like this incredibly passionate almost subculture of a brand that is a precious secret that you know people hold so close to who they are. And it's a time where you're growing the brand and introducing it to so many more people. And so like, wow, what a context for the work that you do. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, um, I feel so lucky to have been able to quickly, I guess, early in my career, identify that I'm at my best when I get to merge my personal and professional lives. And that's really centered me in a zone where I've had the pleasure of working with some amazing brands. You named a few of them. I'd add Vans to the list as well. Sure. And, um, and, and, you know, as a result of, of really being attracted to what I'll describe as sort of passion brands, it's really allowed us to leverage those platforms in a way that goes far and beyond on just the things that we make. Because none of those brands that you referenced, including Backcountry, um, believe that we're here to simply sell things. Um, we know that we have a bigger responsibility uh, as a engaged and contributing member of our community um, to go further and beyond. So at this moment of kind of challenge and change in the world, but also I think important challenge and change in the outdoor industry, how are you thinking about why the outdoors matters now? Like why the outdoors and why now in your mind? For me personally, it's not a moment. It's not a moment in time, although I recognize that there has been this huge influx in the industry and participation in this moment and leading up to this moment. But personally, it's been a it's it's been a personal passion to get people to have more of those moments that the outdoors can generate uniquely. And that's like a sense of release, excitement, this feeling of, of flow when you're sort of putting yourself in this, in this tension moment, but you're really figuring it out. Uh, it's very few things nowadays, sadly, really bring out this sense of feeling alive and, and allow us to break routines or challenge assumptions. And I think the outdoors can offer all of that. Uh, it's a choose your own adventure game, every single moment that you have out there and, and you can choose to really challenge yourself or you can choose to be very therapeutic and healing and kind to yourself. Um, and you can do both of those things in the same venue, um, at your own will, as long as you are out there putting intention behind that time. Exactly. Well, cool. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I'm um, really inspired by how you're stewarding the backcountry brand with the team. The commitment of the brand is to help everyone seek it, find it, and send it. And I would love if you would just explain a little bit about each of those beats in the experience of out there and the role of backcountry as a brand. If you think about the backcountry in itself, it's a majestical place because it's somewhat undiscovered right? And it's untouched. And that notion is so rare and so special. That requires you to go out and seek it, 
So we really want to encourage people to go out there uh, and find what that pursuit is. It doesn't have to be in the backcountry, but find what that pursuit is, is that's going to really help you be at your best. And that's the find it piece. Identify it. And then once you've th- done the work, just full send, man, like give it your go <laughs> <laughs> and, and have the full experience that comes along with it. The thrill, the fear, the laughs, the joy, like it's this send it is really this culmination of the result of the work that went in to find this special place, take the time to be present and be there and be at your best. So seek it, find it, send it together is a pretty masterful mindset to carry with yourself every day. Right on. I love it. And I think you named something about like the idea of backcountry is it is the often the road less traveled. It's the unbeaten path, um, and it is but that that both physically in nature, but it's also a metaphor uh, mm-hmm. for like your own human advent ex- experience and exploration of yourself in communion with nature and with others. And I think right now there's a couple threats to that being available, meaningful, safe, and sustainable for all. So on one hand, there's all of the challenges in the industry and beyond as humans as we're thinking about climate or preserving public lands or wild places, Um, thinking about waterways. Like there's all of those series of threats. And then the very dynamic between the backcountry, which is by definition sort of quiet, it is untouched. It is, and and the idea of access for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, we're in a moment where we're trying to make these experiences real and meaningful for everyone and forever, um, and it requires us to face these dynamics across climate and access and and wild space and places. And I'm just curious, how are you thinking about the role of brands like Backcountry in driving positive impact at the core of what you do and what you're about? Yeah, we see Backcountry as a platform, um, a platform to really drive information first and foremost from a a source of expertise. And again, if it's not, if it's not a gearhead, um, we have a ton of amazing partnerships that will help us round out our expertise. And I think of our partnership with Utah Avalanche, um, as an example of that. And we can bring the foremost experts when it comes to avalanche safety to our consumers in a way that helps them prepare to help them be safer, to help them protect the environment that they are recreating in. Um, And the same goes for a lot of different topics within the platform space. And and you mentioned climate as another example. I think the first thing that we all should be thinking about as we look at ourselves as a platform is shoring up our house. And this is active work that we're doing. Um, It's kind of the never done work, but we're really looking at shoring up our own backyard, um, ensuring that our practices are are, um, putting a better foot forward for the environment and for the climate. And we're also trying to identify services that help us scale that to the way that our customers Customers interact with us and give them more sustainable ways of, of, of interacting with us. And again, and the third piece is, is inform, uh, sharing information about behaviors, small and large, that can help improve uh, our society as a whole. Uh, one of the things that I think all of us have appreciated about the brand over the last year is your I think, deep commitment to the belief that we all belong in the backcountry and the work that you've done to help break barriers by breaking trails and welcoming new ambassadors and new colleagues and new partners into the work and um, identifying advocates who are working to create a more representative and diverse backcountry. You are partnering with folks like Ron Griswell, who helps to um, lead historically black colleges and universities outside, and Juju Malay at Color of the Trails. I'm just curious, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about what inspired the initiative and Breaking Trail, what you've been learning along the way, and what what you would say is where it goes from here? Yeah, absolutely. We're so proud of this initiative. And and I'll just take a step back and just say that, you know, representation is a really big topic 
period, full stop, but for the outdoors especially. Uh, there are countless examples of, of the past of the industry that are really represented by sort of a sea of sameness. Um, and that representation is being pushed in a more diverse direction than ever before. But we all have to acknowledge that we have a long ways to go. Um, but personally, I'm focused and committed to daily progress. And that's what our teams are focused on. And so we've started by uh, participating in the CEO diversity pledge last year. Um, again, similar to my, my note around uh, climate change, we're really looking at our own backyard first um, and ensuring that our hiring practices, our internship programs, and our day-to-day -day are structured in a way that promote diversity um, within our teams. And re with regard to Breaking Trail, the initiative that we launched just a few months ago with, with uh, an amazing set of ambassadors, what we did with that program was we said, you know what, representation is incredibly important, but how can we deepen our relationships and our commitments and our impact beyond representation when it comes to outward-facing content and, and those relationships that we've had? And you mentioned Ron, who is an amazing partner of ours um, and has been for a while. We want to make sure that we're supporting HBCUs outside and, and doing that through his nonprofit as well as the representation that comes along with it. So we've really worked to deepen those relationships and make sure that Backcountry is contributing to the organizations that all of our ambassadors are affiliated with and that we also partner with them to not only improve representation externally, but to also share their voice and their perspectives internally with our herd. And so we have monthly speaker series that they participate in sharing their perspectives and their, their stories. Um, and that's really been an amazing part of this program and energizing for our herd of employees uh, to really hear the differing perspectives and see the true, genuine, authentic connection that we have to each of these individuals as part of the program. And we're just looking forward to continuing to scale. We, you know, we're just getting started. This is, again, a, a body of work that's never done. This is one initiative of so many that we are so proud of that are helping to further our impact here. If you look at our collective platform from our site to our catalogs to you name it, uh, we're really working actively to ensure that, that we show up um, in a way that's welcoming for all. What have been the biggest lessons for you personally, both as a human and a white person, as well as a leader in the outdoor industry? I'm just curious. I can't imagine that one goes through the um, the work that you're committing to and and working on every day, as you mentioned, without being changed by it. So I'm just curious, what's emerged for you? I mean, it's incredibly personal. This is this is work that's far and beyond and bigger than the things that we sell, right? This is very personal work. Um, we're talking about inclusivity. We're talking about big, big topics. And so I think with the high degree of personal investment, um, on the counter side of that, it comes with a high degree of personal stress and wanting to do right by the work um, and wanting to ensure that every step that you take along the way with this work shows progress. One could look at it as as challenging in so many ways because ultimately, at the end of the day, we are one of so many that need to be committed to this to really see scale and progress. So being dedicated, and we are, and I am personally, being dedicated to a initiative that is almost never going to be done takes a level of resilience uh, that I think... Uh, initially is is not really understood. And I think this notion of resilience and seeing the day-to-day -day progress as the reward and really pushing for broader scale by partnering with other members of the industry and, and the outdoors and beyond, it, those are the only ways we're really going to see that scale change, but it takes so much time. So we need a lot of patience. That's what I've learned. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I, I have to say that, you know, one of the greatest blessings over this past year from all of the tragedy that we've experienced, um, and particularly people of color, obviously, is that white people are, in some way, our, our capacity to understand is shifting, and we have different eyes to see the world that we're in. And that is perhaps a great gift and a great challenge, which is once you see it, the bell can't be unrung. <laughs> 100%. And, and so now it's the accountability and the uh, commitment, frankly, like you're saying, to the long game. Like this is 
this this work never ends. This is forever. And, Absolutely. Um, and I'm really inspired by the work you're doing and share the commitment that it's all in work and it doesn't ever end. Absolutely. Amen. And I, I'd love just to ask some really quick rapid fire questions uh, to round out our conversation, which has been so glorious. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Of course. So what have you discovered as sort of your superpower outside when you're out there? What is that? What's that gift you carry? I have a really good balance. Um, I didn't really know how good my balance was until I took up stand-up paddleboarding. But if you try to push me off of a paddleboard, I dare you. I'll, I'll win that bet most most often. Very cool. All right. And to, to wrap up here, my favorite of all, if you could speak with your 20-year-old self, what is the one piece of advice you would share about creating a radically better future? I think it goes back to progress, um, what we were just talking about. Progress is what you have to strive for, and it happens slower than anybody with ambition would like. Um, and so I think as long as you can acknowledge progress and use progress as a way to validate your actions and where you're investing your time, energy, and heart, it allows you to really keep pushing and keep growing and keep getting after it. Um, it's really easy as an ambitious person to, to want to stop doing something if it's not perfect out the gate or if it's not reaching the size and scale of the impact that you aspire for within a, a relatively short amount of time. But you just got to keep on going. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your vision and your humanity um, and for your partnership these last number of years. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, this is such a fun conversation and a place to spend with you uh, chatting about all the things that are near and dear to both of us. Well, that was awesome. And I'm curious, Amanda, you know, as a brand leader and practitioner yourself, and you think about Sarah's stewardship of backcountry and her really, I think, awesome work uh, at REI and uh, before that with with Vans. I'm just curious, like, what do you see inside of her story? And what are some of the takeaways from Sarah's work that you think matter for every brand to think about? I think the mantra around seek it, find it, send it, I think personally, it resonates so much for me. It is related to, you know, my personal relationship to the outdoors. But I think what is so exciting and interesting about it is it is a mantra that speaks beyond a specific activity or identity. It is a mindset that backcountry can own and build community around. Um, and I think brands that are doing that, that are speaking to a higher truth, like seek it, find it, send it, are able to kind of break barriers and, and reach beyond and be more inclusive. Yeah, totally. I think Sarah said it really well. Like this is way bigger than the products that you sell. And now to put it all together, we're honored to share our conversation with Vincent Stanley. He's the director of philosophy at Patagonia, where since 1973, he joined with Yvonne Schrenard to create the vision and tell the story of all that is Patagonia. Hi, Vincent. It is really great to see you. Well, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me, Raphael. It's a real delight. And of course, of course, I just want to have a shout out at the very top um, for our colleague at BBMG, Paul Zanelli, who introduced us and who has worked with you um, in helping just tell the stories of impact at Patagonia in a particular trip that you shared with him to Austin, Texas years ago, where in speaking with a wool supplier, they were trying to convince you how they could lower the cost to the least amount possible. And you actually asked them, hold on, let's reframe it. What would it look like if you were able to honor your team, support and nurture the health of the animals, regenerate the land for the long term? What would that price be? Because that's the price that we're interested in. And in that moment, Paul shared how that reoriented his entire understanding of the role of business in the world. And so I just want to thank you for that moment of inspiration and what truth, truthfully, you just embody in your humanity every day and what you bring 
to Patagonia and what you bring to all of us who are trying to build a better world in a more healthy and whole society and planet through business. So thank you for all of that. We are so excited to welcome you to the Future We Want podcast. And I'm just curious, how would you describe the moment we're in right now, both the perils and the promise, as you think about human beings' relationship with nature and the natural world? Ooh, that's the toughest question, I think. We're obviously in an existential moment, or what certainly looks like an existential moment. The processes that we have in place now, the industrial processes that we use to support ourselves and our economy, are in a headlong rush to absolute unsustainability. The The other thing is that I think that the the problems that have developed are very difficult to see. In the 70s, when we had widespread support for environmental legislation and amazing action on the part of um, a Republican presidency in Congress to create the EPA and some of the other protections for urban air and water, those problems were so clear. I mean, the Cuyahoga River catching on fire, you know, and then the, the smog in Los Angeles, I remember, I, I would tell this to our younger employees that I'd drive the van to LA in the summer and you just expect that your eyes would be watering when you got out of the van because that's the way the air was before they took the lead out of gasoline. But the problems we've inherited for the past 40 years, the deterioration of the environment is more invisible. Uh, The acidification of the ocean so that phytoplankton can't support life. The the remaining pollution of rivers, and, and especially the um, the loss of oxygen through 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 algae, th- those are not things that actually stink; that actually are in your face. And um, the loss of topsoil. I mean, nobody thinks about where the food comes from. So I've lived in California all my life, but in 2017, when we had wildfires, they. Uh, shut Patagonia down for a good 30 days. We had 75% of our employees were uh, disrupted, uh, had to move, uh, and mostly because of smoke, followed by COVID, followed by the heat dome that we just had over the Northwest. So, And you see all of these, anybody who has to look long range at the future is having to deal with climate change. So... As if everything becomes much more visible much more quickly, and if we still have time to make changes, I think the average person will come to the position that the average person came to in the 70s to say we really need to address climate change. The other thing is that everything else is coming to a head. I mean, Pope Francis in the there's a wonderful encyclical in 2015 called uh, Laudato Si, or Care of Our Common Home, mentioned that the social crisis and the environmental crisis look like they're two crises, but they're one and they're intertwined because the environmental crisis affects poor people first and most. And we can't really deal uh, with the environmental crisis without also dealing with the problems of, of poverty and equity. The only other thing, I'm, I, I'm sorry to give such a long answer to this, but it's, it's such an interesting question. There's a woman named Monica Sharma who worked at the UN for a very long time who did some amazing work. My, my, my favorite story about her is that she persuaded the imam of Cairo to declare a fatwa on female genital mutilation. And, and she did this by working with Egyptians and by working with Muslim women. But her thesis is there there are three important universal values to all cultures. And one is dignity, the other is fairness, and then the third is, is compassion. And it seems to me that these three universal values are the values that we have to appeal to if we're going to move forward. We're going to need a heaping amounts. <laughs> of, of, of uh, reconciliation and talking across the aisle and learning to work together in uh, business, government, civil society if we're going to 
make it through the crisis. So I, I, um, I don't know quite how you appeal to those universal values, but I do know from uh, Monica's example with the imam that if you get underneath the ethical issues that actually divide left and right or rich from poor or white from black, I think there's your opening to pursuing some course that will put the human beings back on the right track to get past, get us through. That's really powerful. And what I appreciate about it is that it's a take on the commons in a values or a moral perspective, which is the yeah. idea that we share universal human values that give us a way in to right. understanding and how to heal our own individual relationship with nature and then to protect the commons and our common humanity as a consequence through nature. And our, I think our common home is such an elegant way of framing yeah. it from the Pope um, that I think speaks so beautifully to it. With a business purpose to save our planet and guiding values aligned with what you shared with Monica around dignity, fairness, and compassion. You've been leading the conversation and helping to inspire and participate in activism on the climate crisis, on public lands, wild spaces. And I'm just curious what is emerging now around access and inclusion, what's emerging around indigenous land management. I'm, how has have you personally and how's the company thinking about the next horizon of activism as it speaks to creating access and welcoming all mm -hmm. to our public lands and life outdoors and ultimately the reconciliation of public lands and the, the role of the indigenous community looking now, looking to history and looking forward. Yeah. With those kinds of dynamics, becoming increasingly aware across the broader scope of the outdoor industry. How are you thinking about these dynamics? How are you navigating leadership with integrity and impact? You know, I think it's interesting that the, the George Floyd moment, which had been really building for the past seven years since, since Ferguson, happened in a time of COVID. It really affected our employees, including our, especially our younger employees, who I think really led, led the effort within the company saying, you know, we're really behind the eight ball here. We're pretty white. Our industry is pretty white in terms of how we represent ourselves and in terms of uh, the people we're engaged with. So what do we need to do to advance this. But I, I think there are a couple of key areas for us. And one is the whole issue of environmental justice that does affect the, the poor first. Um, though I often point out to other people in, inside and outside the company that a lot of Trump supporters are also uh, victims of environmental injustice, even when they are not environmentalists. The, the current economy that we have that I benefit from and you benefit from is good for about 35% of the people. It's great for about 35% of the people who have a college education and connections and skills. And it doesn't serve about 65% of the people, including rural white folks and including uh, urban uh, people of color. So there, there, I think there are three areas. One is environmental justice is really is really important, and we 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 give quite a lot of money, and I think we're more engaged with groups. I think we have the potential in our urban stores to create pretty meaningful relationships with uh, environmental groups that are primarily not white or primarily from poor neighborhoods. The second area is that you refer to as indigenous, which I think is really important because. We really, at this time, that we were just talking about the kind of the crisis of the spirit or crisis of values, there, there are things I think we need to learn from indigenous traditions about our connection to nature, that we're not apart from nature, and connecting to the very rich indigenous traditions of the United States is really important. The third element is our outdoor communities. 
So we have strong relationships with climbers and with skiers and fly fishers and surfers. And I think that that's another area where we can work to make sure that uh, we're appealing to, that we're engaged with the most diverse group of pe- people possible within each of those outdoor groups. And of course, then there's internal hiring practices and all that. So it's a huge topic for us uh, on many fronts. The one idea that I want to bring to the table when we're talking about these issues is to make sure we don't forget that we're a part of nature and that we're an environmental company. For instance, you can get into arguments about how how much access, how, how should it be easy for people to be outdoors? And I think there are lots of arguments. Yes, you, you do provide access for people who aren't able and you do all kinds of things. But you also want to preserve the value of the experience of nature, which involves risk and it involves a sense of, of, of awe, of being in a place where you're not the master. So I don't, I don't want the outdoor industry to lose that. I mean, that's what we're good for, is that we provide gear and we talk up uh, the value of the experience of wilderness. And I don't want to, I don't want to lose that in the kind of the traditional battle of who's more important, people or nature. We're we're part of nature. It's an inextricable, inextricable relationship. And I think the opportunity that you're sharing is that there's a human transformation that happens when we're in deep communion with nature, yeah. where we understand ourselves differently, we understand each other differently, and we understand our relationship with the natural world. That is both part of the human experience and all of humanity, and the inheritance and the custodial challenge and stewardship of our species yeah. for the planet, as well as, I think, something that's inside of the the connection that you're talking about, which is that when we have an experience of awe and wonder and reverence, that that just shapes our humanity and it also shapes our capacity for environmentalism. And yeah. I, that's, that's my hope as well. This is a delight. It is such an honor to connect and, and to share this moment and this set of reflections and aspirations for where we are and where we might go together. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for reaching out. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the work you're doing. Right on. Be well. Thank you, Vincent. Take care. That was really great, Rafe. What's your takeaway for brands after your conversation with Vincent? He's awesome in every way. And I particularly appreciate a couple things. One, even on the journey to thinking about diversifying the outdoor industry, Vincent understands that the purpose of their company is around environmental impact and that that's inherent in that is that everyone has an authentic, safe, meaningful, and successful relationship with the outdoors and that everyone is, as a consequence of that, is a steward for the environment. I think the other thing that Vincent captures so beautifully is a lot of empathy for the perspectives on nature and whether you are a person of color who was raised in an urban environment or a rural middle-aged white man um, who is seeing the world change around you and trying to find some grounding under his own feet. Like just an empathy for the fact that this is the provenance of humanity, the obligation of humanity and the opportunity for humanity to find the right relationship uh, between human beings, our society, and nature, and that that's the work. And I just feel like may may every brand be so lucky um, with the foresight to have a philosopher on staff and a chief storyteller. Because as we've talked about for many years at BBMG, to meet the moment we're in, it's this combination of shifting the structures and the systems that no longer serve and that can be overtly exclusive or flat out racist or unsustainable on one hand and on the other to retell the stories of humanity and how we can understand ourselves in that story from all of the breadth of our backgrounds and experiences and aspirations. 
that's the work. And each of our guests today really embody that beautifully. As usual, a perfect summation. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to The Future We Want from BBMG. We've been speaking with Teresa Baker, founder of the In Solidarity Project and the Outdoor CEO Diversity Pledge. Sarah Crockett, CMO of Backcountry, and Vincent Stanley, Director of Philosophy at Patagonia. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll subscribe and spread the word as it helps more folks find the podcast. For more information about our guests and more resources and recommended reading on the outdoor industry and the role of brands in the world outside, visit bbmg.com. The Future We Want is produced by Liz Courtney. Original music and audio production is by Go Destroy Art. See you in the future.